know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Learning Bible Stories. Learning Bible Stories are so important that we study them and that you know, sometimes when we are young that we can act them out. It's just another way to remember them. I think one of the most uh, familiar Bible stories that people know would be the Christmas story because we put so much emphasis on that story and we have our Christmas pageants and so forth. And if there's you know, one time that people go to church throughout the year, it would be Christmas. And so they hear the Christmas story. And so if you ask people, do you know a Bible story? They will say, well, I know the Christmas story. Well, one of the things that we would like for people to, one of the things that I would like to emphasize with people is that we learn stories, all the Bible stories, so that we learn them as well as the Christmas story. To say, oh yeah, I know that story, and what an interesting story, and what is it about a Bible story? You know, who are the people who are involved? And as God interacts, as God in, you know, comes into the lives of these people, you know, what is, what is happening? What is extraordinary? What's miraculous? To say that, and then at what point to say, but in my life, yeah, this is a special story, and it's an exciting story, but where do I need faith to believe in this story? And then just to simply say, well, this is some antiquated story, that is, you know, basically like legend, lore, mythology. You know, to say, well, what's different about this story? To say, well, no, this is really the truth. <laughs> that this is of God and that this story also pertains to my life today. So that as I know the story, I know the story for my life in the contemporary world today. That this story takes on, you know, flesh and blood and, you know, today and in my own life. That I'm quoted with this story. And so, yeah, you probably can say, yeah, I know about the Christmas story. And, and some of you, depending upon how much you've learned about the Bible, saying, well, I know what John 3.16 is. And I know the 23rd Psalm. I know the Lord's Prayer. You know, but maybe that's about it. But if you do know more stories in this, what would be those stories to say, well, yeah, just like the Christmas story, I can tell you about this story. And this is why I like this story. This is why I find it interesting. This is why I can relate to this story. To say, I really have connected with God as I hear this story. And so one of the stories that maybe we like to hear are the stories in the Bible where we hear about like a fishing story where Jesus is out with his disciples and we hear about Peter and they're going out for a great catch. And so a lot of times we resonate with a story like this. We're engaged in a story mainly because so many of us have wedded a fish, a fish line. We, if we aren't people who go out fishing often, we've been fishing somewhere in our life and, and whatever that time was when we were out fishing, we probably have a story to tell. And so that's one of the things as we gather around a campfire that we like to hear those fishing stories. Now, here again, I'm not much of a fisherman, I have to admit. I've gone out fishing in my life, but I'm not very good at it. And that's kind of what makes this story kind of interesting and kind of peculiar. And what makes, you know, so I've got a fishing story. Now, I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin where there were people in the community, a lot of people who were, um, who were fishermen. And they were actually very good at it. And they were all outfitted. Once in a while, I would get invited to go with one of these fishermen, you know, because they had to have the big pickup truck to pull the nice, big, fancy boat and you got fish locators, and you got a, all of the, the fishing gear, you know, as far as the pole and the tackle, and you know, even the live water well, and, and everything like that. They're all, 
I mean, they, they've put in everything, everything that you can get to be a modern fisherman today, to go out on, to be an angler on one of our lakes, that they had it. And if something new came out, they would be going to one of those sports stores to get it because they wanted to get the edge to make sure that they would catch the big one. But I never had anything like that. And there really wasn't a big lake around, and so a lot of the people, they would either, they would pull their boats to the Mississippi River or they would go further north uh, to go into the lake region where they could find a lot of water to go fishing. And so in my hometown, what there was is just this small river that flowed south of town. And eventually this river would flow into the Mississippi River. There would be some backwaters and things like that. And so what it, my brothers, a couple of friends and myself, so I think that was a total of like six people, is that this little river that would go south of town, it's a river that we would go swimming. We had a few swimming holes, but we also had a few fishing holes. Now, nobody would fish this river. And so my, my understanding or my theory of the whole thing is that you'd have these big northern pike. You know, that's a game fish. They would swim up from the Mississippi River, and, and they would really grow to be a big size. I mean, trophy size fish. And they would kind of hang out in these holes. Now, northern pike, I, I like the taste of northern pike. They're a lot of fun to catch because, you know, they're a big fish. You know, the reason why a lot of people don't like them is that they're kind of hard to fillet. They're a very bony fish. But if you can learn to fillet these fish, you know, the, the, the food is, the, the fish is actually very good tasting. But my brothers, my friends... And myself, we would get on our bikes, and sometimes I'd go by myself. More often than not, I'd go by myself, but they would all do the same thing. I'd get on my bike, and I'd ride down to the river, and there would be like these three holes that I would go. And it wasn't a very big area at all, a very small area. And so all I would have to do is I had my fish pole with a little fish lure, a daredevil, and I would just flick it into the hole like this. And I just have to reel it a couple of a few times, and I would see this flash underneath the water. I mean, that would be one of these big fish that was striking at the lure. And just like that, I would, I would have that fish on my lure, and it would be a little bit of a fight, but then I would just kind of <laughs> yank the fish up onto the shore, and there it was. I mean, these fish were anywhere from 10, 15, uh, once I caught one that was like 20 pounds. And so as I would be riding my bike home with this big fish, and the fish, and I'm not exaggerating, it was so long that, that the tail was almost hitting the, the pavement of the street. And I must say that I was a little bit on the, the proud side as I was riding along on the bike with that fish dangling from the handlebars. And the neighbors who would be, or all the people that would be on the streets, you know, out in their driveways or in their yards, in their garages, they would be, you know, looking at me and they'd be going, Jeff, wow, look at that fish. That's a whale. And they would be, you know, kind of wondering, where did you catch that? And I'd be, you know, kind of riding through town, just kind of, you know, acting nonchalant, like, well, this is no big deal, really. But, but yet, you know, here I, it was like I was carrying a trophy through town as I was riding my bike. And I'd get home, then I'd fillet the fish, and my mother then would fry it, and it was quite a fish fry that we would have. But why this is so <laughs> kind of a peculiar story is that, like I mentioned, so many of the fishermen who were outfitted to the, to the hilt with all their boats and gear and, and everything, they wouldn't, not to say that they wouldn't catch a lot of fish and catch some nice sized fish, but but comparatively speaking, they would never catch these kind of fish. So here again, here I am, a novice fisherman, coming home with a trophy-sized fish that um, a lot of people would have mounted and put on their wall. And so that's my fish story. And as you're hearing my fish story, you're probably thinking, well, okay, Pastor Jeff, you know, that's, that's interesting, but oh, if I could just share with you my fish story this day, and I would love to hear it. I love to hear fish stories. And, 
and I'm sure that you have some good ones. But I'm going to read to you right now a good fish story from the Bible. And you listen to this, and it's maybe one that you've heard before, but let's, uh, we'll read it and see, well, you know, what does this mean for us? And it's from Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for, for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Okay, well, this story takes place at the lake of Gennesaret. And so Lake Gennesaret, well, that would, uh, that's one name for this sea, which is maybe more commonly referred to as being the Sea of Galilee, or this, and then it's also called the Sea of Tiberias, but we generally hear it as being the Sea of Galilee. And I've, I've been to this sea as I was to the Holy Land. And one time when I was there, I actually got on a boat and took a little excursion ride on the Sea of Galilee. And I must say that was very inspiring. It was a thrill. And as, on, and as I was on the boat, I was thinking about all these stories. You know, about when the big storm came up and, and, Jesus, and Peter was beckoning or, or Jesus was beckoning Peter to walk on the water and you know all these stories. But the sea isn't that big really. When you think about a sea you think of a big body of water but really what this was it was just you know kind of a large lake. It was fresh water and, and that's what made it good for fishing and that's you know kind of the big industry on this lake would be that of, of fishing. And so now Jesus was in the, this area, and as he would go to communities, what he would do is that he would be preaching and teaching in the synagogues. Now synagogues, they would be, well, they were like the churches. That's where, well, even today, Jew, Jewish people, they go to synagogues to worship. And so after the temple was destroyed, then they'd have synagogues in each community, and that's where people could go to pray and listen to a rabbi teach and hear the word of God. And so that's where Jesus came to preach, and to preach to say that as we hear the word of God, as far as the law and the prophets, that it's all been now fulfilled in your hearing. But what is interesting about today now is that Jesus is not teaching in the synagogue, but rather he's out in the country. He's by the seashore. He's on the seashore preaching. And there were so many people coming to hear him preach that he had to step into a boat and go out just a little ways off of shore so that he could preach, but the boat was his pulpit. 
And that's interesting because as I think about these stories, and, I, and I'm sure if I thought about it, I could probably think about when Peter probably was in a synagogue listening to a rabbi preach, and probably he did, but, but I wonder if he ever really was. You know, here he is listening to Jesus preach as he is washing his nets. And so, yes, for instance, I, I'm a pastor of a church, the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, and I preach from a pulpit there. But we think about our pulpits that we may have outside of church. And so as a pastor, I think, well, what pulpits do I have around town where, where I can teach people and, and talk about the Word of God to people who probably aren't going to be coming to my church on Sunday morning to hear me preach? So how do I establish those pulpits? I mean, that gets to be a little bit trickier. But yet, you don't have to be a pastor to be proclaiming the Word of God. I know one summer I was working uh, in a factory. And, and during the break time, we would go into the break room and there would be tables there. And as people, workers would gather around a table, they would talk about stuff during the day. And of course, the subject of religion would come up. And especially since I was working there and, and then I wasn't necessarily going there with a big with a big blow horn telling everybody, hey, I'm studying to become a pastor. But it just happened as, you know, you know how it is when you go and you're kind of the new worker and you sit at the table and everybody's wondering who you are and they've got the 20 questions, so to speak. And 20 questions, are, we're going to try to figure out who you are and what you are about and, and what we think about you and whether or not we really want you to be at our table or not. And so it came out, you know, that I'd say, well, I'm studying to become a, a pastor. And, you know, it was like, they kind of like, well, we don't really know what to think about this. I mean, some people thought, well, that's really nice. And, but, but anyway, I got to stay at the table. I don't know what that meant. <laughs> but what was interesting is that throughout that summer, as I worked at this factory, that people would seek me out from time to time. They would want to sit where I was sitting, and they would have some religious questions to ask. You know, I got the sense that a lot of these people were not darkening the doors of any churches, but yet they had spiritual questions. They, they want to know, what, what, what can you tell me about this? And so you think about that in your life, that, that maybe you got those pulpits that are naturally set up in your life where people gather where you can talk and share your faith. Maybe places where Pastors either don't go or they are not allowed to be. But yet you can go and share your faith with, with people. But that's what Jesus is doing, is that he is out there preaching in the open air on, on the lake. It's interesting because the great preacher, John Wesley, great theologian preacher uh, from, from England, he came... But that's one of the things, as I, as I did a study about his life, is that yes, he had his church in London, but he would have thousands of people who would hear him preach, and that church in London wasn't large enough to, it wasn't a very large church, really. I don't think you can have thousands of people coming in there, so maybe that's part of why he would call it open-air churches. That's where, when you're studying about his life, that, yeah, you're always kind of looking, okay, this was a preacher, a theologian, and, and so you're looking at where are those churches that, you know, that, that they preached in. But for John Wesley, it was more, no, this is the spot where he was preaching, what we call an open-air church, where it was sometimes a vacant lot in the city or a field out in the country where people would gather. And he felt that he could bring more people to salvation as he was out there in those open-air lots and fields preaching than he did in, his, in, in the church building that he was preaching in. And so there is something to be said that Jesus, yes, he was preaching in the synagogue, but he's also preaching out in society. 
And he wasn't being a lunatic when he was out there, you know, with the big blow horn telling everybody, you know, that if you don't, you know, come to Jesus right now, you're going to be going to hell. You know, because I've seen that and, I, and people just are more turned off uh, to religion than anything. It's just like, oh yeah, they're all just a bunch of weirdos and that's the last thing that I want to be. You know, so when we are out there, we have to be, and it's not an easy thing, you know, how do we, how do we make Christianity, the word of God, attractive? Okay, so he's preaching and, and then he goes and he looks to Simon and to these fishermen who had been out there, saying, you know, go out again and, and cast your nets. Now, Simon Peter, he is a professional fisherman. You know how they fished back then? It wasn't like, you know, like what I was explaining with the fish pole and the lure, but they would have these big drag nets that they would put out. And then they would put them out, and hopefully they'd have a big catch. But they were fishing all night long, and they had nothing. Have you ever had that in life where you've really worked hard and you really have nothing to show for it? It's really frustrating. It's really frustrating. And the last thing that you want now is to have some smart aleck come and make a comment. So think about it. You know, if you're like me, which I'm sure you are, there have been times in your life where you've really worked hard at something and now you have nothing to show for it, and people notice, and now they can kind of make fun of you. And you don't appreciate it very much. Well, that's almost kind of how this seems. I mean, here's Simon, the professional fisherman. He'd been out there all day, all night long fishing. He had nothing to show for it. And now Jesus is saying, Simon, go out there again, but this time just cast your nets on the other side of the boat. Ha, 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 funny. That's all I need right now is some smart aleck joker coming along. But that's not how Simon took Jesus, and that's not what Jesus was trying to do. It wasn't like Jesus was trying to make fun of Simon. And, you know, so Simon must have been, and, so, and who's Simon? Simon is also Peter. Here again, we got these names not to be confused. So if I talk about Peter, I talk about Simon. And not, I'm not talking about two different people, but they're the same person. But Simon is, um, was listening to Jesus preach, and so he goes and, and he does what Jesus says at his command. It doesn't make any sense. And that's the thing that a lot of times when it comes with faith, it's like, this doesn't make any sense. Kind of like Naaman, as we read in uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, when he's this Syrian commander of the army, and he's got leprosy, and now he's humbled to say, well, you know, that he's supposed to wash seven times in a Jordan River, and this doesn't make any sense. And so he's arguing with Elisha, the prophet. This doesn't make any sense. But finally, it's like, well, okay, I'll take God at his word and his command. It doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to go on faith, and he was healed of his leprosy. Okay, well, think about ministry. A lot of times, well, this doesn't make any sense. And so this is where we walk by faith. And as we walk by faith, every step, okay, now it's starting to make more sense. Now I'm starting to see more clearly. But as he's out there, his nets were so full, filled overflowing, that they had to ask other fishermen to come in and to bring in the nets to the point where their boats were so full that they were beginning to sink. And now that's quite a fish story. I mean, it's almost like this is a catch of a lifetime for a professional fisherman like Peter who had fished the sea all of his life. Like, this would be the catch of a lifetime. Well, no, this isn't the catch of a lifetime. This is more than the catch of a lifetime. The catch of the lifetime would not equal the fish that he got. This was an act of God. Only God could do this, and it could never happen otherwise. And so that's the thing, is that God has come and he's filled our nets. In other words, he has filled our lives with salvation beyond what we can ever imagine. 
that he fills your life with salvation this day, that Jesus Christ, who died on a cross, is arisen from the dead, and the Holy Spirit's been given to fill your life with all of the blessings of the heavenly kingdom. And that's the thing that you have got to get from this story. And that, you might say, well, that's really cool, but no, you just pray today. You just pray saying, God, you know, forgive me of my sins, and I repent of my sins, and Jesus, you died for my sins, but then you pray for the Holy Spirit to come. And the Holy Spirit comes, and it's amazing. And it's amazing what you can do then. And you're so full of God that that's what matters now. You know, the things of this world can't fill our nets like what Jesus fills us with. Our richness is with God. And when we're filled with God, then we're just excited about what God is doing, and we want to follow God. We want to hang out with God, and we want to, whatever God is doing, that's what I want to be. And I've known a lot of people in my life where, you know, whatever the church is doing, they're there. They just want to be part of it, and they're so excited to be part of it. But Jesus gives the commissioning to go out and make disciples of all nations and saying, well, you come and follow me. We're going to go out and we're going to be fishers of, of people now. We're going to be bringing uh, people into the, to the, into the love and the grace of God. That our boat is going to be out there saving those who are lost, saving those sinners you know, that they may be baptized in Christ Jesus, coming up out of the water, and uh, we will now be filling up heaven's kingdom full of people. And so what an exciting thing. You know, that's the most exciting work that there is in the world, is to be bringing people to God. And that uh, it is by God's, you know, just like God allowed that, that big, you know, as far as that big catch goes of fish, well, that's, it takes God to be able to do that. And we can do all the work, but we need to be praying that God makes people ready so that as we do share the word of God with them, that they won't take us as being a bunch of stupid fools, but rather to say, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. That registers with me. In other words, the Holy Spirit is working in the person's heart as you are ministering to them, and you will know that. I mean, you will know it right away. If you sense that the person has got this hardness of heart, then you back off. You know, there's no point in har uh, arguing with a rock, so to speak. But we, but we can feel it when somebody's open to hearing the word of God. And so that is Jesus. Jesus calling his disciples to follow him. He's uh, making these fishermen now using their skills for the kingdom of God to bring people to Jesus Christ. You know, what a blessed calling that God has given to all of us, that God has given the church to do. You have been watching to Know Christ with Rev. Jeff Peterson, pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Prayer, a practical guide to getting God's direction. Thank you for watching, and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.